And where, where is the clicker? Uh, it's right. It's on the, okay. Um, Okay, thank you all for coming. I'm Summer. I'm the curator here at the museum. Before we get started, everybody take a second to turn off or silence your phones so we don't have any disruptions. Um, so I just have a couple quick announcements, just our, um, our July programs. So our July brown bag on the 5th will be with Mark Hebert. He's the director of Eastern Forest Resources at Rainier, and he's gonna discuss Rainier's sustainable forestry. And then our July 3rd on 3rd will be with George Kotlick, and he wrote a book about British East Florida in the Revolutionary Era. He's gonna be talking about that. Um, so those are all the announcements, but tonight we have Dr. Neil Wallace. Excuse me, before we go further, Oh God. <laughs> yeah. You do. Oh. <laughs> so for those of you who do not know, this is probably Summer's last third on third. Aww. And you can thank her fiance, Mr. Quincy, back there. Because they will <laughs> because they will both be moving to Maryland. Yeah. Mid, you know, so her last day will probably be sometime in mid July. So this will be her last third on third. So oh, we can but she will come to the brown bag. Yeah, yes, back. she will be <laughs> for the brown bag. So you can still see her at the brown bag. So we are going to miss her. We congratulate her and Quincy. And we wish all the best for them. And and collections research in the Jacksonville area. In 2011, he published his first book titled The Swift Creek Gift, Vessel Exchange on the Atlantic Coast with the University of Alabama Press. Since that time, Neil has conducted field and laboratory-based projects throughout much of Florida and adjacent states and the Bahamas. So everyone, please welcome Neil. Okay, well, thanks, Summer, and the museum for inviting me uh, tonight. Uh, I'm, I'm honored to be here, and uh, I thought what I'd do for this talk is uh, basically explore what I think are interesting aspects of pottery that's local to this area, and also I'm going to keep to things that I know something about, so I, I can't do any, everything. So. Um, so what I'm going to do is give you kind of three um, vignettes based on pottery that was made by indigenous people in the past uh, in Northeast Florida uh, and including Amelia Island. So I'm going to start looking at what's, what's actually the earliest pottery in North America, which is fiber tempered pottery. And um, so it dates to about 5,000 years ago. Um, and then I'm going to uh, explore this kind of pottery that's called St. John's, which is this really distinctive kind of pottery that's uh, local to Northeast Florida that has sponge spicules in the fabric of it. Um, and then finally, I'm going to talk about all of the diversity and different types of pottery, especially that occurred from about 600 BC to um, 900 AD. Uh, in Northeast Florida and the connections that uh, those types of, of pottery show to other areas of, um, of the Southeast. Okay, so first section, fiber tempered pottery. So this is the earliest pottery in North America. Um, the earliest pottery wasn't made on Amelia Island. That superlative goes to the Savannah River Valley. Um, there's a type called Stallings pottery that dates to about 5,000 years ago. A few hundred years later, uh, we get fiber-tempered pottery in Northeast Florida along the coast, and it's referred to as orange 
fiber tempered pottery. And it's not called orange because of the color, although a lot of it has this kind of oxidized orange color. It's, it's named after uh, basically Orange County, Florida, where it's found down there too. Um, so what's distinctive about this is that um, they added Spanish moss, typically. Some, sometimes it um, seems like palmetto fibers were used to the clay to form the vessels. And then um, when the vessels were fired, it left these, these voids. And you can actually see all of these kind of uh, striations. That's from the fibers burning out when the uh, vessel was fired. Uh, this is a cross section of one of these. It shows really dramatic holes in the, the vessel um, after it was fired. And actually sometimes, um, well, a lot of times in a cross section, you can see charred remains of the uh, fibers. Basically, the when the fiber is burned, it shrinks, and so it leaves voids, but also there's a little, a little kernel of, of charred stuff in there, and that can actually be radiocarbon dated, which is really useful. So there's, a, um, there's three different types. There's orange plain, which is just a, a vessel that has no kinds of markings on the exterior. There's orange incised, which has uh, geometric patterns that are incised into the, the exterior. And then there's this curvilinear incising and punctation, and this is kind of rare, but it's called Tick Island Incised, named after the Tick Island site um, in the central St. John's River Valley. Um, and uh, this is CT scans of fiber-tempered sherds from St. Catharines Island, Georgia, um, that Dr. Matt Sanger did. Uh, and you can see just how um, pervasive the fiber is. These are voids left by the fiber, and so it's kind of chock full of this stuff. Um, so the earliest vessels um, are basically open bowls. And we know this from research all up and down the coast from southern South Carolina down to central Florida. Uh, they come in a, a range of kind of sizes, so from big basins that are like half a meter wide to smaller bowls like this, but there's, there's really not a lot of diversity in form like we see later on. Um, and so basins and bowls is kind of the rule. You can see these are profiles of, of vessels. So these are basically cross sections of what the, the vessel wall looks like. And so you can see some diversity here. Some have kind of smooth contours, others have kind of abrupt corners, and that might relate to different um, forming techniques. So some were made maybe with slabs that were actually joined together on the corners. Others were made with coils where basically a clay coil was wrapped around like this and then bonded. Um, and here is a really great example that we have in the museum that's from near um, Silver River, near Ocala, uh, from a, a subaqueous site in, in the water. And um, so this is half of one of these orange fiber tempered uh, incised vessels. Uh, personally, I've never seen uh, this, this much of a vessel preserved um, uh, in person before, other than this one. And so you can see it takes that um, you know, open, this is a large vessel, there's no scale on this photo, but this, this is probably, well, I'm exaggerating, it's probably this, this big across. Um, and these, these yellow portions are, um, plaster that we water soluble plaster that we use to um, to piece it together um, and you can see a nice close-up of these incised lines here so one of the interesting questions about fiber tempered pottery and early pottery is um, you know why did people adopt it when they did and and there's there's various theories um, about why people adopted it um, and if you, if you think about it, the only reason it's gonna catch on is if it's useful, right? And so were there, were people uh, preparing food in different ways? Were they eating different things 5,000 years ago that necessitated using pottery as containers? And uh, I don't think there's really a consensus right now, but um, one of the leading arguments is that uh, basically, there needed to be more containers for large gatherings, like uh, to have feasts. So you have to be able to cook a lot of food and also be able to serve a lot of food. And so one of the kind of correlations with this kind of pottery is that it, it shows up at shell ring sites. So shell rings are these rings of, of shell midden 
So piles of shell and, and other food remains that occur in these circular formations. The earliest one in Northeast Florida, I think, is um, ox eye shell ring, which is over in the Tumuqua Preserve on the north side of the St. Johns River, um, just southwest of here. Uh, there's a, a little bit later one that's on Fort George Island that's called the Rollins shell ring. And these are big, um, big features. So they're um, 100 meters across, typically. Uh, at least the Florida ones are. These go up and down the, the East Coast, up to South Carolina. The South Carolina ones, they're actually real s small in comparison, and the Florida ones are larger. Um, but be that as it may, the, the fiber timber pottery, it, this is pre-pottery actually at Oxai, but then when you get to Rollins and a lot of the other, most of the other rings, um, and I've circled kind of the areas where there's lots of these shell rings where people gathered, they probably were living at these sites, but also, most archaeologists think they're having these big gatherings and feasting, and a lot of the food remains that we find are from these, these big gatherings. So if you have an environment where, a social environment, where you need a lot of containers, and you're limited by the supply of alternatives, like, like wood, like uh, soapstone, when you're farther north, there's soapstone. So the Stallings Island culture on the Savannah River Valley use so soapstone vessels where they basically carve a bowl out of the stone and you can imagine that takes a lot of a lot of time and effort and if you want to scale up that process you want to make a hundred times more bowls you have to put in a hundred times more effort but pottery is actually scalable because there's parts of the manufacture process that don't take this that, that you don't have to magnify the amount of effort by the number of vessels you're going to make so for example the drying process you can dry a hundred vessels pretty much as easily as drying one, right? You can fire a lot of vessels um, easily too. And so it's sort of the scalability that, that might have made the invention of pottery um, attractive. Okay, so that was the first vignette. And these go lo get longer as I go. Because um, I get, get sort of more, more interested as we go. Yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt, but getting back to the fiber pottery. Yeah, yeah. It would almost seem like it would make it be easier to crack with all those holes in it. I should have, I should have mentioned that. Okay. So, why, so why do people add temper to vessels? So there, there's a few reasons. One is the workability of the clay itself. So like if, if the clay is too sticky, then temper often will, will um, make it more workable. It's also to improve the firing characteristics and the, the, the um, durability in terms of thermal stress. So a temper like, like fiber, um, it, makes the vessel, it makes the vessel lighter, but the, the porosity actually can help um, with durability because it stops crack propagation. So you can imagine if a crack forms, then that stress is relieved when it hits a, a void. So, um, but the other thing is uh, that I forgot to mention is that they're using these vessels um, for a cooking method called indirect heat cooking. So rather than putting the vessel on a fire, they did that too, but, but there's a lot of evidence that they started using it for indirect heat cooking. It's also called uh, hot rock boiling. You put a, a hot rock, um, they're using soapstone further north, but they're using all kinds of, um, you know, even fired clay um, in other areas, and you cycle those things through the vessel, and the, the, por the porosity of provided by all those voids makes it an insulating container. So it's like a thermos, and so it stays hot compared to, I'll show later, like quartz um, fragments being used as temper. That's a conduct, that makes it more of a conductive material um, for the, the heat to pass through it. So, so it's sort of like a, an igloo cooler, um, you know, to, to keep the, the temperature controlled inside. Thanks for mentioning that, because it reminded me of something I missed. <coughs> Um, okay, so the second theme I wanted to talk about is, is this St. John's pottery, and it's really distinctive. This is a cross-section magnified, and you can see it looks sort of like the reverse of, a, um, of an Oreo cookie. And so what this is, is this heavily organic core where the organics that were in the clay didn't oxidize, and then on the exterior and interior of the vessel, it's oxidized, so all those organics have been burned out. Uh, and this is a really fine paste, so unlike the fiber-tempered pottery where you can see all these holes, 
there's virtually nothing in this. And early archaeologists called this temperless pottery. They, they didn't think it had anything in it. <clears throat> it turns out it does have what we call aplastic constituents. It has things in it that are solid. Uh, and these are sponge spicules. So they're the, the silicate, basically skeletal bodies of freshwater sponges. And this is a um, highly magnified version. This is actually a SEM image, scanning electron microscope image. And this is just a petrographic thin section where we cut an extremely thin slice and looked at it under a microscope. So they're these, these silicate rods. They basically look like fiberglass. So how did these things get in there? And this kind of pottery is distributed all over Florida, but especially the, east, the, the northeast coast of Florida and especially the St. John's River Valley. So that's why it's named St. John's. If you go to um, like areas near Deland, Florida, the assemblages for thousands of years will be 99% St. John's pottery tempered with these spicules. So, um, oh, and also, so the, this type of pottery dates really far back, more than 4,000 years ago. Um, some of it is contemporaneous with the orange fiber tempered pottery. And actually this vessel is from that same site um, near S Silver River that the, the previous vessel was from. And you can see it has kind of a similar form. It's an open basin. Th this one is unusual because it has this kind of, um, you can see part of it, it has this kind of rib in the, the middle there. Um, and it has incised lines, just like a lot of uh, orange incised pottery. Uh, but it's used up until um, colonial times in different areas. Um, so there are a few kind of main types. One of the main ones up here that we see is called St. John's check stamp. And so people carved a wooden paddle and they impressed that design into the exterior surface of the vessel. We get all kinds of shapes and sizes of the, of the checkerboard kind of motif. And, um, and we know that uh, this actually dates later in time, so it's going to come online around 700 to 800 AD. And actually even later up in this area, it seems like people might have migrated from further south, like ar around Lake George and up into the Jacksonville area. Um, there's red painted pottery that has a St. John's paste, and this, this type is called Duns Creek Red. You can see the red um, paint on here that's preserved. And then underneath that is that light. A lot of it is this really kind of light um, color where it's been oxidized. And then below that is the really dark kind of organic core that's going to become relevant in a second. And then there's actually all kinds of decorations on a St. John's paste that has the spicules. So here's an example with all these kind of intricate punctations. Um, and it's a type called um, Pappy's Bayou punctated. That's more of a Gulf Coast thing. So you, you won't find that much in Northeast Florida. But this is this is distinctive to Northeast Florida. You're not going to find it anywhere else. Yeah? Do they do this just for decorative purposes or also to add strength? Um, I think it's mostly decorative purposes because there's so much plain pottery, it kind of suggests to me that the the other surface treatments are, are decorative. Yeah, good question. This type is called Colorinda, and it has a very tight kind of uh, chronological window. I think I'm getting this right. Keith Ashley defined the chronology of this. I think it's 950 to 1000 AD is what he says it is. It's somewhere in that range. What it is, it's a sand tempered sherd that has the St. John's sherds as temper as well, crushed up into little pieces. So only these little particles have the spiculate um, grog in there. So yeah, so grog, crushed pot shirts. This is cool. So, but it's so unique that they, they pretty much only chose the St. John's pottery to be grog during this period. So they didn't use the sand tempered pottery, they used the, the speculate tempered. So, I, I've been curious, um, how did the spicules get in there? Um, archaeologists have said uh, that you know they were added as temper that people were burning sponges there's actually examples of this in the Amazon where they still make pottery this way they use it as temper they burn the sponges you know it's really kind of gruesome because um, the those little silicate bodies are are dangerous to like to breathe in and to handle um, 
So, yeah, they're getting like pulmonary thrombosis or whatever from breathing this stuff in. People are coughing up blood. That doesn't sound very appealing, but maybe they did that. Um, but others have said that it, the spicules are in the clays that they're using, and they're just sort of natural inclusion. So I, I hadn't really thought about this too much until I, I worked on a site that's actually not related to St. John's Pottery. This is in Gainesville, actually a mile north of campus um, at UF. And um, so I happened to be drawn to this um, dried up sinkhole pond. There used to be water in this thing. Um, a landowner came and brought all this interesting pottery to the museum and, and he said, I was digging in my backyard and found this and I was like, take me there and <laughs> let me see. So, so he dug this huge hole and I convinced him, you know, we got to do a more controlled excavation. So we were digging in this stuff and it's a, it was a, a layer of peat and then there was this ash layer where all the pottery was located. And part of this is irrelevant to, to this story, but um, we, as we're digging through the peat, I'm just like itching like crazy. And it's all these, these silicate, um, you know, sponge spicules that are irritating my skin. Um, and, and so I realized, so I, I failed to mention this kind of pottery, archaeologists refer to it as chalky, the texture of it. It's real kind of powdery. And now I call it ashy because I think it's actually the organic remains that are, that are burning and turning to ash and it gives it that, that kind of texture. But anyway, so, so when I was digging through this, I was like, Spic spicules don't cause the, that texture, which is what some archaeologists had said before. That feels like fiberglass. It's terrible. It doesn't have that soft texture. But then when we got down here, this, this was basically a context where the pond had dried up. 1,300 years ago, there was probably a lightning strike, and that whole peat um, column burned and condensed down to this ash lens here, and that's where we found all the pottery. Oh, cool. um, and so the, but the ash, of course, feels like the, the St. John's pottery. And so I, that, that kind of made a light bulb go off for me, and I was like, um, you know, maybe, maybe they're using sediments like this to make the St. John's pottery, and so what we're feeling is the burned kind of exterior. Um, so we actually did some experiments. There are, there are clays that have spicules in them that uh, we've, we've collected, um, natural clays like on, on streams and stuff. And when you fire those, they don't feel, they don't feel chalky or ashy. Um, but what we also did, um, because there's this other question, this kind of distinctive pottery, when we find it in other areas of the state, is it, is it brought in from, from the St. John's River Valley or the Atlantic Coast? So like if we find it um, on the Gulf Coast near Tampa Bay, when we find it near Gainesville, um, is that kind of pottery, is it brought from where it's much more prominent? So we, we wanted to test this and we also wanted to um, see what are the constituents of, of the fabric of St. John's pottery. So we, we did this study um, where we looked at the, um, the pottery chemically. So we're looking at this huge array of, of elements which are different at each of those three sites. And so we, um, we think that at each of those areas, the St. John's pottery is made locally. So um, it's not sort of unique clay sources to one part of Florida. It's something that's available everywhere. And then kind of the kicker was we did x-ray diffraction, which shows you the, um, the mineral constituents of the sample. And we saw that there's smectite that is the only clay in these samples. And smectite is associated with really low energy freshwater environments like bogs. Um, so we think that probably the spicules got in there because they, they're basically taking sediments from, from swamps and bogs and they're making that into pottery. And there, there's not that much clay in it, but we actually think the silicate bodies kind of keep the, the vessel together. Um, so if it weren't for those, you probably couldn't make a vessel with that little um, clay in the vessel. Okay, so that was the that was the second, and now the third and grand finale, we're gonna be talking about pottery um, in what's called the Woodland Period, which starts at about 1000 BC and goes to 1000 AD. And in particular, I'm gonna be talking about really the, the, the second millennium and that from like um, 
1 AD to, to 900 AD. So there, in this time period, there's a huge diversity of, of pottery. Um, and St. John's is part of this, but there's also this huge variety of surface treatments. So this is kind of a snapshot of things that you might find in, say, like 600 AD. You'll find all these different kinds of stamping designs, all these kinds of punctations, um, again, a check stamped, uh, lots of different kinds of incising, some zoned kind of painting. These are a, a kind of diversity of surface treatments, and there's actually dozens of, of different kind of varieties. A lot of this is going to be sand tempered. So people move to a, um, a quartz sand temper predominantly, different sizes. Some is, is, this is sort of what we refer to as grit. It's kind of coarse, sometimes it's very fine. Um, there's something unique about uh, Northeast Florida around the Jacksonville area. There's a little bit of it actually on Amelia Island um, at a site on the south end of the island, but it's charcoal tempered. So th this is a cross section of this charcoal tempered pottery, these little black um, inclusions here. We actually did a study to identify the species of wood in here, and it was mostly pine, but there's also things like sassafras and um, I think there was some cypress. Don't hold me to that. Um, you can see, this is a nice example. So in these sherds, a lot of times, the, since the, the wood shrinks when it's, um, when it's charred, the charcoal pops out, so you get these voids on the surface. Um, so this really only occurs near the lower St. John's River. Um, and it's really kind of like east of downtown um, and on the north and south side of the river there, and up a little bit like to southern Amelia Island. Um, and it occurs in this really tight window of um, like 200 AD to, to 5 or 600 AD. Um, this stuff is really cool. I think we discovered because there's also bone that's in these occasionally, and there's also grog, little pot sherds that occur occasionally. We said these, this is probably made with hearth content. So they're taking you know, their, their fires and they're scraping up the, the embers and all the stuff that's fallen in there and crushing it up and mixing it into the pottery. And it's this really localized tradition that's um, not really found anywhere else. It's really cool. Um, okay, so the, the vessel forms during this period, um, they become really diverse. So we have... Um, a, a range of, of cooking vessel forms. Instead of those wide open kind of basins for the indirect heat cooking, like with the fiber temperatures, they're putting the vessels typically in the fire and, and the quartz temper helps make it a, a conductive container. Uh, this is a really classic kind of form for a woodland period vessel, this kind of subconical shape. Um, and a lot of times they're sooted. The, these vessels are from the, the Dent Mound, which is uh, north of uh, the St. John's River. And a lot of times we see soot that's adhering to the rims of these vessels, uh, which proves they're used in cooking. So these are typical cooking vessels. Um, these other forms um, I refer to in my book as ceremonial preparation because they often have soot, some of them do, like this little jar here has, um, has soot on it, so it's used for at least heating something up. Um, but you don't find these forms really outside of, of mounds. And this is, a, this is a type that's referred to as, um, as Whedon Island. So did you say that those were ceremonial and you call them death? No, well, I don't, so they, they actually tend to be, they're buried in mounds that have human burials, yeah. but they're actually often not placed with any human remains. They're actually placed on the margins of the mounds. So whether they're part of a, a burial rite um, or not, I think is, is open to interpretation. But they're, they're always, certainly- They're always found in the vicinity of a, of a burial mound for- That's right. They're, mo mostly you don't find these kinds of vessels in, um, in like a village midden kind of context. In a tra you don't find it in a trash pile, typically. And then um, these vessels, you know, maybe some of these are, are serving vessels, and we actually do find vessels like these, small kind of cups and bowls in um, village contexts. Uh, but then things like these, these multi-compartment trays, we call them, um, 
I've heard someone irreverently refer to this as a chip and dip bowl. Um, but actually at the dent mound, they found in, in one container, there's um, yellow hematite and another one there's um, red hematite. Um, so they're separating you know, these, these pigments, at least in this case, and maybe other substances. There's also um, these little tiny things, like this one here is, is a vessel like this big. Um, and this is probably like a like an amulet or some kind of thing that might have been worn. And there's actually, you can't see it here, but there's little holes for suspension on on that one. There's you can see a hole on this one here. That's also that one's probably like this big. So a lot of diversity in vessel form. Um, and then what's really interesting to me is the stamping. So stamping becomes kind of ubiquitous. So 600 BC. We have kind of the first stamped type, which is called Deptford. This is Deptford simple stamped. There's also Deptford check stamp. This is the first check stamping in the region. Um, the, those early vessels, um, Deptford vessels, in a certain time period, also have these little podal supports on the bottom, which is, is kind of cool. Um, and they actually get smaller through time. There's this evolutionary trend where they start out pretty big, and then by a few hundred years later, they're, they're like these little symbolic nubs. They're just sort of there to, to be seen, but not used, really. Um, Deptford linear check stamped. So these are all um, kind of early stamping techniques. And, and part of it is tied to the manufacturing technique. So people are building these coiled vessels. They're stacking these, wrapping and stacking these coils. And they're using what's called the paddle and anvil technique. Um, this is a woman in Indonesia using the same technique where she's got, um, sometimes you can just use your hand, but she's using a, a stone and then she's using a carved paddle to impress this, this um, design. It also is used to bond the clay coil. So you have to kind of, kind of smack it to get out um, air pockets and also to bond the coils. Um, here, here's a woman making some coils. Just to kind of visualize what a coil looks like, and then those get wrapped around. Um, this is a St. John's vessel where you can see what we call coil breaks. So the weak point in the vessel wall is where the coils are joined. And so you can see here, there are these breaks that go kind of linearly parallel to the, to the lip of the vessel. And um, there's actually holes drilled into this vessel to tie twine across those breaks to keep this vessel in use. So we think this is like an important heirloom vessel that you know, people were trying to keep in, in use you know, long after it was useful for like holding things, at least liquid. Um, you know, I don't, they probably weren't using it as like a colander. It's more, it's more um, keep, keep it alive. So, um, so this is the part that I really wanted to get to where the stamping designs become really complicated. In fact, this is called complicated stamp pottery. It's called Swift Creek Complicated Stamp Pottery, named after a site in central Georgia where it's first defined. And there's all these kind of intricate designs that are carved into wood and impressed into the vessel. And this occurs for about a millennium, and it, it's, it's um, really prevalent here on Amelia Island. The stamping occurs on all kinds of shapes and sizes of vessel. So all those you know, vessel forms I showed before, we see the stamping occurs. Um, and actually in the, the earlier kind of first few hundred years when this is used, the stamping tends to be all over the vessel. And then later in time, they make these zoned kind of um, areas where they stamp in the design. Okay, so we've never found a wooden paddle that has a design on it because they've all decayed. I'm hoping one day we'll find, you know, like a, a wet deposit where uh, organics preserve and there's going to be like a big cache of carved wooden paddles. But this is what um, someone posted for the National Park Service as an idea of what one of these or a couple of these would have looked like. Um, and they, you know, we imagine based on the impressions, these are about the size of like um, maybe a, a ping pong ball racket or something like that. You know, something like maybe the palm of my hand, something like that. Um, not too big. So one of the interesting things is the, these preserve art that was carved into wood. So a lot of times they're overstamped, meaning they're, it's kind of stamped 
and obscuring the design, but we can piece together what the whole design looked like. So here's one example from a site on the Gulf Coast um, that we think is a panther face. So I've had uh, um, several students work with me and my team to kind of reconstruct these designs. A lot of these are faces of some kind. I don't, I don't know what this is, but I, I think, you know, I, I tend to see a face. Um, this is actually turned, it's, it's turned sideways um, on this um, shirt, the way it's impressed there. Um, and some of this is just really intricate. Um, and so there's not a scale on this, but, but the, you know, each of these little lines is, is really close together, just, you know, like, I don't know, half a millimeter apart or something. Um, here's some more. The, these two are faces. I think this is a, um, maybe a roseate spoonbill rendition here. <laughs> um, and some of these, I, I don't, I think it's hard to speculate. Um, I think one time someone said this is a person wearing a hat, but I don't, I don't know. Um, okay, so here's some really cool designs. Um, Frankie Snow um, is a archaeologist in southern Georgia who for decades was looking at this kind of pottery in that area and, and drawing the designs. So these are some of his designs, and uh, I'm kind of... Uh, partial to the faces. So a lot of these I think are, are also some kind of faces. He calls them masks, which is um, kind of suggestive. Um, and so here's some more. Keep, keep, a, keep a memory of this one, because I'm going to show this one uh, in, in a couple minutes. This one actually is represented right off Amelia Island. Um, it's Cra the Crane Island site. Does anyone know where Crane Island is? Yeah. yeah. So it's just west of the of the municipal airport, right? right. Yeah. So there's there's a representation of this on Crane Island. So one of the so the designs are really cool. It preserves the art that we can reconstruct. But what's even more interesting to archaeologists, or at least to this archaeologist, is um, that each of these designs can can be like a fingerprint. It can represent a particular wooden paddle that's impressed into a vessel. And so there's, there's two ways we can sort of identify a unique design. One is that there's, there tends to be kind of asymmetries. So overall, they look symmetrical. But you can see in this one example, well, you can barely see it. Sorry, it's blurry. There's like two hatches here compared to three on the other side, the mirror image. So um, that's sort of you know, we look to see if that's replicated elsewhere. And then even more important are these idiosyncratic kind of flaws, like cracks in the wood. So you can see this little line here. That was not intentional. That's a crack that developed in the wood as the wood was expanding and contracting as, you know, it was, it was like being, um, getting wet and, and dried. So that is, is a random kind of mark that we can find on multiple vessels, and so we can prove it's stamped with the same paddle. And that's useful because what we can do is trace impressions of one paddle at multiple sites. So with this particular design, there's a vessel from the Mayport Mound that has the same impression from the same paddle as sherds from these sites on the Altamaha River in Georgia. So that's a little over 100 kilometers away. And um, some of the work that I've done has actually used chemistry and mineral inclusions to source the pottery. And we know that this vessel was actually brought from one of the sites up here. So here's your Amelia Island connection. And so, sorry it's such a, a small scale here, but uh, this design is found at Sherds at all these sites, some of the same ones on the Altamaha River and this Crane Island site, and then the Dent Mound um, on the north side of the St. John's River there. So people are connected well along the Atlantic coast, and they're moving pottery, and, and maybe, you know, they're, they're integrating their, um, you know, their communities too. So, um, we scaled up this research to go beyond just the Atlantic coast. Um, I worked with my colleague Tom Pluckon at University of South Florida, and we, we looked at um, 67 new sites. Um, the, here are the ones I worked on for my dissertation. 
And then we, we mostly focused on the Gulf Coast here, and we incorporated all these sites that Frankie Snow, who I mentioned earlier, had, um, had studied with his design database to try to look at connections across this whole region. So how do these sites connect to each other? We can, we can do this with Swift Creek Pottery. It's really kind of remarkable. So what we did is a network analysis, and every line is a paddle match that connects sites together. And then the size of these squares relates to how many connections they have. So in this case, the Kings Bay site, and probably most of you know where Kings Bay is, right? Just north of here, this has lots of connections to the north, to the south, and then also into the interior. Um, so that's kind of the hub of um, you know, connection to a different region. Wow. Um, and you know, through this network, we basically see that you know, people in Amelia Island are potentially connected all the way into southwest Georgia and onto the Gulf Coast. Um, and we did some other kind of network analysis that defines groups. We're called actually communities in, in social network analysis jargon. And, um, and so what we see, this defines really well that these Atlantic Coast sites from the middle St. John's River up to the Altamaha River, that their only connection really to the other regions is through this Kings Bay site. And if we look more closely at that Atlantic community, um, the Florida sites are in green and the Georgia sites are in yellow. We actually see that um, there's some, I mean, this is sort of limited evidence because there's that many, that many ties between sites, but basically um, this, this dent mound on the north side of the river is better connected than the, the Mayport mound is. So the Dent Mound has connections to all these Florida sites. The Mayport Mound really just has connections to the Georgia ones. So that's kind of interesting. Um, and then, of course, Kings Bay is central there. Is that a possibility that, um, that the Kings Bay right across the river here would, would be like a central transport point for all these different areas of tribes and families? I actually, think so. You know, actually say, okay, here's where we cross. Yep. Right here. Yeah. Because it's a safe way to cross, or it's a, it's a good place to be for a while. To, and so it, it looks yeah. like a dispersement center, sort of. Yeah, and it's it's sort of surprising. Actually, it seems like maybe the Satilla River was more of a corridor than like the Altamaha River for whatever reason. Um, and so yeah, I think it was like a transportation corridor, which probably became like a trading outpost and, and yeah, yeah. things like that. So yeah, I think, I think that's what's going on. Um, so, and this, this is as deep into the weeds as I'm gonna get, I'm almost done. But we also did a network analysis <coughs> that compares the types of pottery that, is, that are at sites to each other. And if they're similar during the same time slices, the same time period, then we made a tie. We said, okay, these are similar, so they're probably connected. Um, and so this is, these are these different kind of time windows looking at the distribution of all these different types of pottery. So there's dozens of different types, and we're just looking at the frequencies of each of those. And what we can see is there's definitely um, a separation between the Gulf Coast, which is represented by, by pink or red, pink and red on, this, on these figures, and there's a network that kind of connects a lot of this, this northern area, actually. But then through time, we see that they all become joined, or, or a lot of them become joined across this whole area um, with the, the proliferation of certain pottery types that we know come out, come out of southwest Georgia, the, what's called Whedon Island. Um, and so what's interesting to me is that, so this Atlantic coast phase here, 300 to to 550. Um, this is when we have charcoal tempered pottery, so it's really kind of unique assemblages. And then through time, it becomes part of this larger kind of network, and, and they're, they're really well connected. We actually have ties with similarities of pottery between the Atlantic coast and southwest Georgia. We don't have those direct ties represented in the design matches, but that's because I think um, they, I'm gonna go back here because they went through this area here and we didn't represent these sites in our, in our sample of pottery types here. 
So it's basically just cutting out the middleman in our analysis, but we know that they probably were connected through groups here. So um, that's where I'm going to leave you. So you have plenty of time for questions. Right at the start, you had mentioned that, that this is the ear earliest place in North America where pottery has been found. Yeah, where it's the earliest place in the South time in the Southwest, yeah. the Zuni and earlier people there, right. also the Northwest. Yeah. It, this predates all of that? It does. By, I can't remember the exact number, but millennia. So the reason yeah. that I'm curious about that is because of the theory that people. The way that it got populated in North America was up across uh, the Bering Sea on the bridge, right? Yeah. But people came to, it makes sense that they would be on the western part of the United States first, but yet the pottery, the pottery itself shows that people were maybe here before that on the well, east coast. Well, so. I mean, how does that, how does that work? So the, the earliest inhabitants of the Americas are definitely here, 14,000, actually more, we're, we're getting back into probably 20,000 years ago. The, pot, the earliest pottery is 5,000 years ago. So they're living, you know, they're living here without pottery for 10,000 years, probably. Um, and so then they, they, they invented it more. They invented it. It's an here. independent invention here. here. Yeah. So yeah. There, are, there are actually independent inventions of pottery around the world. I can't remember how many there are, a dozen or, or more. And um, the earliest is somewhere in Asia, it may be Japan, it may be China, it's, it's starting to be debated. Um, and that dates back 12,000 years or so. But the earliest north of the Rio Grande is um, 5,000 years. So on this continent, on the northern continent yeah. of the United States, yeah. the inventions, they're not, they're separate? They're totally separate, yep. Yeah. yeah. There have been arguments that um, because there is some early pottery in northern South America that's fiber tempered, that maybe there's a connection there, and that you know, someone someone came up 5,000 years ago and introduced pottery, but it's not very well supported. Um, that's it's kind of a fringe theory still, I think. So I'm starting to catch on that it's not all about pottery; it's about tracking. It's about early, people. About yeah. early human yeah, yeah. development. Right. Track through product. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, when you, I see these decorative tablets and you talk about them with regard to pottery, but when you see illustrations of what people think some of the early natives look like, they have tattoos that resemble these. Mm -hmm. So I mean, did these yeah. things, were they made for pottery or were they made for a bunch of other applications too? For the the body? I, I think we may never know. But I, I think it's likely that they had some of these designs on their bodies, whether that was tattoos or even just um, you know painted designs. So I think that's probably likely. And another um, question: Yeah, is the shirt and the shard the same thing? No. So archaeologists usually refer to pieces of pottery as shards and pieces of glass as shards. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Go ahead. Yeah. What is the composition of the workable clay body in this area? And is it on the river? Is it something that's still here? Or is it under like the sediment? So I think it's complicated. I know. I um, I, there is, there's, so we actually have in the museum um, clay samples that have been collected from all over the state. And it includes um, a lot in this area. And they seem like they're found kind of everywhere. Um, and I, I don't really. I don't know. They, they come from a lot of different sources, I think. Um, kind of a, a hodgepodge. Um, and I think some of the ones we collect were probably not used for making pottery at all, and, and, but some of them were. Um, so like I think you know, the, the St. John's pottery that I mentioned from, from basically swamps, um, that's, all, that's all smectite, and, which is really kind of sticky. Um, but with the with the spicules in it, it makes it workable, I think. Um, but there's other there's other clay minerals too. I mean, there's there's kaolinite. Um, so, yeah, I don't I don't really have a good answer for you. I think there's a variety of clays. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I can share with you I could share with you the locations where some of the those clays came from. Yeah. Yeah. 
see if you can find them again. Is yeah. there a, a name been assigned to the pre Tamuk ones, or, uh, or so, of, what do we call those? Yeah, so we, we basically tend to, well, they're, we call them archaeological cultures, and we name them after sites where they're kind of first defined based on the material culture. So, you know, there's the Swift Creek culture where they made all this complicated stamp pottery. There's the Deptford culture, which is um, based on a site at the mouth of the Savannah River, um, you know, where they made a bunch of check stamp pottery. But what they call themselves, we don't know. We just don't know that. Um, and there, you know, I think we see that there's probably a lot of movement of people over time. And so, you know, it gets challenging to say, if you go back 2,000, 3,000 years, are those people ancestors of the Timucua? Maybe. I, but I don't know. I mean, they, they, they could have moved from another area. Um, I mean, I think they're all from the, the region, but they could have been from, you know, southwest Georgia. Yeah. Yeah. I was curious, how long has the pottery um, paddle research been going on to correlate with other locations? Is it recent, or has it been going on for decades? So, good question. It, it dates back to the, the earliest kind of rudimentary work on this was in the late 60s. Um, and it's just sort of um, snowballed from there. Um, and that, you know, the, the first, well, I, I, I guess I should say that Frankie Snow, who I mentioned in South Georgia, was really the pioneer and the leader in this kind of work. And so he created his own database where he's making all these matches. There's just thousands of, of matches between sites that he, that he was able to make himself. And then, um, yeah, and then probably the last, I would say the last 30 years, things have ramped up where there's lots of researchers. Well, I shouldn't say lots. There's a handful of researchers that have um, contributed to these kinds of studies. What about the digital that you've shown today for the last few slides? Doing that kind of network analysis, that's the first time anyone has done a network yeah, analysis. About that. Yeah, about that research. We, we just did this a few years ago. Um, okay. That's the first time that I know of, yeah. Yeah. You showed some of the vessels being directly in fires. How were they fired originally? So probably in, in bonfires or open an open pit. Yeah. Um, and so there's, um, there's a lot of ethnographic analogs to this where you basically pile up pottery on the ground and you build a fire around it. Um, you basically cover it with, with burning stuff, and then um, and they tend to be short fire duration. So um, you know, I think the average is 20 minutes or so. Um, they could be longer, but that that limits the amount of, of heat, right? So it, it can only reach um, really 800, 900 Celsius, um, whereas a kiln can get much much higher than that. And so. One of the things we see in a lot of this pottery are those what we call cores, which are organic, um, basically organic material that hasn't combusted, hasn't oxidized. Um, and so, you know, sort of like, um, the, and I should say that the clay is not vitrified. So the clay minerals are not really um, bonded. It's called sintering. Right. When it gets to a certain temperature where it's, it's not going to um, be rehydrated and turned back into plastic clay, but it's also not as well bonded as, as, as if the minerals are totally deformed and vitrified. Yeah, so all of the pottery is, is of that ilk. It's all um, open fires, no kilns. So that St. John pottery, it looked like it had three layers. Yeah. Were they actually all separate layers, or was it just the way it ended up? It's the, way that it, it's the way it oxidized. So the, um, the fire was all, it's a combination of the amount of heat and the duration. It only oxidized that sort of skin of the vessel. So it's probably a short duration fire. And also with that really fine paste, we tend to see a, a kind of sharp boundary like that. So that was the, the interior and the exterior of the vessel wall. And then the center is that dark core. Yeah, that, that didn't oxidize. Yeah, did I miss anyone? I, I, can. I was curious, like when it correlates and there's like a lot of them that are in one spot, is that because they are big tribes or is it like a big city 
refer to lots of tribes to meet, like a, like a farmer's market or something like that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, actually I can go back here. So some of these sites, um, like this is the biggest one here, Colomoki is the, probably the largest population center north of Mexico at the time, like 500 AD or so. Hmm. Actually 600 AD is probably its maximum. And so there are several hundred people living here then. So that's the biggest, most prominent kind of cultural center. And so it kind of stands to reason. People are kind of coming there to gather from all over. And so that's why we have all these connections here. Um, and then in terms of like clusters of sites, that's just a sampling issue. So like, I'm not sure there's, well, I know there's not more sites represented here than like say over here. It's just that Frankie Snow did so well sampling all this stuff that we have a big representation. Whereas here, we didn't do as good of a job. Yeah, but in terms of the size of the squares, which show the number of connections, um, some of these sites, it's because they're just big sites with lots of people, I think, and lots of visitors, probably. Okay. Um, whereas, you know, some, some of these other sites that are big, like Kings Bay that we mentioned, that's actually not as, it doesn't compare to Kolomoki or even like probably this site near Tallahassee, Block Stearns, but it, it's just a good travel corridor, maybe where people were, um, were trading. They're definitely converging on this area, but maybe for a different reason than they were at Kolomoki. That's my interpretation, at least. Okay. Any other questions? No. Or do we have time for any?